Hello, I'm Emma Bruner, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study with 18 undergraduate degree programs. Today's guest is Lauren Smothers, independent owner of Light Trap Books in Jackson, Tennessee. So this is Scott Williams, your host of Real Foot Forward here from Discovery Park of America, where every single week we talk about the people, the accomplishments, and the history of our home right here in West Tennessee. I'm really excited to talk to today's guest because she has accomplished something that so many people talk about wanting to do, and she's done it in the middle of a pandemic. So welcome, Lauren Smothers. Thanks for having me. So before we jump into what you're working on right now, and um, it's very much going to be interesting to hear about that, let's go all the way back to the beginning. You've had a fascinating uh, childhood. Uh, Tell me about where you were, where you grew up. So um, it's it, it's best to say that I call Jackson home because um, I've lived well all over the world. Um, my family is originally from Jackson, and so I grew up you know, coming here, visiting grandparents and such. But um, so when I was a young child, I grew up all over the state of Tennessee. But then when I was about eleven years old, my family um, moved overseas. Um, my parents were in Christian ministry. And we lived in Russia for about a year, and then we lived in the UK for six and a half years. So when I graduated high school in 2006, I was in London, England, and I decided to come back to the States and attend college here in Jackson at Union University. Um, So when I arrived here and, you know, coming from London where um, on my street alone there were 30 different languages spoken to the twang and to uh, the churches on every corner and barbecue. It was a bit of culture shock, not necessarily all bad, but it was, it was definitely an adjustment, but I definitely appreciated um, having that diverse background for sure. What what did your uh, parents do before they became missionaries? Um, Well, my father was a pastor, um, so that's why, um, and he pastored um, small country churches um, here in West Tennessee, Um, and my mom uh, was a homemaker. She also homeschooled as kids, Um, and so, yeah, I've always, you know, the way that I was raised, I was, you know, very much in kind of a setting of you know, being in the communities and being around um, people and people of faith and faith practices, which definitely influenced, um, I think, my writing um, later on as I grew to to love um, creating and um, I guess that that drive to connect with people definitely came from um, my childhood and how I was raised. So how, how old were you again when your parents let you know that you were getting ready to move to Russia? Um, I was 11. How'd that, how did that go over? (laughs) Um, well, I was excited. Um, I was the kid that, so, you know, growing up in, well, rural, uh, West Tennessee, and I was a kid that, either, you know, did have her nose in a book or I was outside in the woods scrambling around and I always loved kind of adventures. And so that to me, moving to a foreign country was an adventure to me. I wasn't yet at the stage where I think I was like, oh no, I'm going to, you know, leave my friends, which that happened later. You know, I think the realization of, oh, I'm leaving everything familiar behind. And so that probably hit, you know, later on. But at first I was, I was just excited. And what city, what town were you living in at the time when you were going um, We were in, oh shoot. We were in Spring Creek, um, which is in Madison County. Okay. Um, and you, any siblings? Yes. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And so when I know enough to know that when a family uh, is going to go into missions, that there's a lot of training that the whole family has to go through. What kind of schooling before you went to Krasnodar, I think is the first place that you mm-hmm. went? What, what, uh, what's the process? 
Um, sorry, can you repeat? Question? Yeah, they, they they obviously don't just stick you on a, tra- a plane and fly you into Russia. What is the process that the family has to go through? Hmm. Um, well, um, yes, there there is a process, and um, there is um, time dedicated to preparing um, individuals and families for um, overseas work. Um, a lot of that is training from um, experts and professionals who have served um, long term and also who um, either have clinical and or um, ministerial experience of, you know, these are the challenges that you're going to face and that's going to be um, language learning um, and also cultural differences and um, also um, kind of seeing how, you know, rather than, oh, we're the American, you know, because most of the folks um, training were Americans, not all of them were, um, but kind of, you know, recognizing the cultural sensitivity that needs to come with um, that kind of life. Um, So, yeah. So you're a West Tennessee kid who gets a little training and then steps off the airplane in Krasnodar. Did I say that right? Yes, he did. And so what, what is, what are some of the biggest challenges you remember the biggest differences, the biggest, what are the things that as a kid, you know, were, were the most fun or the most challenging? Um, so for me, I think the, The challenge, well, for all of us, for all five of us, was the language. Russian, I would say it's the most difficult language in the world to uh, master, but it is and in the sense of, well, the alphabet, Cyrillic alphabet, um, and um, immersing ourselves, because we didn't go to a language school. That's a traditional way of, you know, you could go to a language school, but instead, um, we studied Russian through... uh, tutors, and also living life there. So um, one of my, I think, fondest memories is the house that we lived in in Krasnodar. Um, It was a shared space with our landlords, and our landlords had um, four kids, and their daughter, Oksana, was actually the one that I would say I learned the most Russian from because really the best way to pick up a language is from a child. She was two or three years younger than me and conversing with her. And a lot of it was sign, you know, mimicking things, a lot of gestures. Um, and I always credit her friendship as the way that I was able to make those connections and not feel because the excitement, you know, I mentioned earlier of moving to a new place. Yes, that that also turned into a little bit, well, of anxiety of nobody understands me. I don't understand other people, but having friendships, for example, with Oksana, with her siblings really put me at ease. Um, Also, um, I think I, you know, when I talk about living in Russia and I was there only for a year um, significantly. So I, we lived there, 1999 to 2000. So Y2K happened when we were there and we stayed. Um, but that kind of as a cultural moment, um, you know, we prepped, we didn't know, you know, a lot of the narrative at the time was, you know, a lot of crazy stuff could happen. And so it's, it's funny, well, funny, strange to look back on that and like realize, well, nothing happened. You know, it was a normal like New Year's, but Um, you know, it, I still just love that we were there at the time and we experienced it with the Russian people. Um, but also the, um, the history and the culture, particularly of Krasnodar. So Krasnodar is in Southern Russia, um, in it's North of the Caucasus mountains. So if you're looking at the map, um, it is way far South of Moscow. Um, it's in between the Caspian and Black Seas. Um, And so the people there, it's, you know, we kind of talk about, well, folks in the South here in the States, and it's kind of like that in Russia, like Southern Russia, it's a totally uh, distinct culture. And um, 
the kind of history behind that area, they're very strong, independent people down there. They, there's been a lot of conflict and um, bloodshed, particularly when we're there, because um, south of us, Chechnya, um, and, and still to this day, um, there are tensions between the Russian government and the Chechnyan government. Um, and I think living in Russia, even as a child, recognizing these tensions between people just based on their ethnicity uh, or their religion, uh, Chechnyans are majority Muslim, whereas Russians would be, well, agnostic or the Russian Orthodox. And that tension, you know, I picked up on, um, and it was, it was interesting and also hard to deal with, um. I mean, you saw you saw a lot of challenging political culture. I'm sure as your family began working with Kurds, um, for for folks who aren't as up on that as uh, others, can you explain a little bit about you know the Kurdish people and and the kind of work that your family was doing in London? Right. Um, so when we moved to the UK in. 2003. Um, the reason that we, we picked London um, was because there is a large Turkish population, immigrant population um, in London alone, now in the UK. Uh, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but there are millions of Turks that have immigrated um, and that are asylum seekers. Um, and asylum seekers were primarily who my parents worked with, they helped teach English, conversational English, um, because there was a great need for that. Um, and by asylum seekers, um, I mean folks who are fleeing um, political, um, slash it could be war specifically, um, you know, the Iraq war was happening at the time, there are Iraqi Kurds. Uh, we worked mostly with Turkish Kurds, but that are fleeing violence, oppression, um, marginalization from their own governments. Um, and the Kurds, um, so the Kurds are interesting in the fact that they do not have their own country. Um, they are an ethnic group, so there are Kurds from Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Syria, etc., but they you know, and they claim, you know, areas of those countries that's therefore referred to Kurdistan. Um, but they're, because um, they are a people without a country, um, the, the Kurds carry, well, a couple of things. They're very proud people. They um, are proud of their culture. They're proud of their, um, the form of Islam that they practice, which um, they are Sunni Shia mu Muslims. Most of them are Shia if they are practicing. Um, but there's also a form of folk Islam that Kurdish people practice called Aliviism, um, and that's probably, um, at least in my experience, um, the most commonly practiced um, religion. But the Kurds, um, I think there's also a lot of, we saw a lot of trauma associated and um, that, that these people dealt with because fleeing one's country or fleeing one's homeland where you are told you either, you weren't allowed to speak your own language for years and years, you weren't allowed to go to schools uh, for your people, sometimes you weren't allowed to practice certain aspects of your religion. Um, well, that traumatizes you. It traumatizes generations. Um, and so when they ended up in places like London and I ended up meeting them and becoming friends with them, um, it's, you know, as an American, you know, I, you know, I, of course, I'm a history buff. I, my grandfather taught history um, here in Jackson, at Jackson State, and at Union for years, and I've always been fascinated by history. I think as an American, we take it for granted that we have a linear, okay, 1776, and then we have a nation, and then Civil War, Emancipation, and then we have all these kind of distinct errors that we, eras that we can kind of point to, whereas um, being around the Kurds who, 
do not have that in many ways. I think, um, I don't know, it made me passionate about, um, I guess, it made me passionate about people's acceptance of their identity and, um, and also a humanitarian outlook that I brought when, when I came back to the States um, and in thinking about, you know, as an American, you know, and thinking about, you know, my place in the world and the privilege that I have, um, whereas the, the Kurds do not enjoy that as much. Maybe did, that was a long um, did you start to gain an appreciation for reading and writing while you were in that mm-hmm. culture? So um, I have you know, I was a reader as a young child. I had my nose in a book. Um, but then my, I, when we moved overseas, I started writing. I actually can remember the f- first poem I ever wrote. Um, it was when we were, we were visiting um, the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. Um, and I remember writing this poem and I remember thinking, okay, I wrote a poem, so I'm going to write more. <laughs> so that, so <laughs> I guess, yes, being overseas is where I started to recognize that writing was a form of, well, it was a safe place for me. It was where I could go and express my feelings, my whether that was I'm happy, sad, um, angry, scared. Um, I started doing that and also as a place to, you know, writing as a form of, creative expression. And, um, so yeah, so, uh, throughout middle school and high school, um, yes, I was increasingly drawn to reading and writing and that influenced my decision to, uh, well, to attend college here in Jackson. I knew um, I wanted to study English. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I was interested in reading, writing, perhaps teaching, um, And so I mentioned uh, my grandfather taught history here in Jackson. My grandmother taught English um, at Union for years and years. She had retired by the time I got there. But the English department at Union um, is one of the best, um, not just in the state state of Tennessee, but in this region, hands down, um, an excellent group, uh, professors, and really um, mentors. Did your whole family move back when you came back or did you come back uh, individually alone? Yes, I came back alone um, and they followed um, about a year later. Um, My dad actually, my dad was, uh, my dad served in the Navy um, before I was born. He was enlisted, but he rejoined the Navy to become a chaplain actually. Um, The, I guess it was the year or so after I moved back. Uh, which he is currently, he's still a chaplain. Um, so, but yes, the rest of my family moved back. I can, I can relate. My dad was also a minister and we traveled around and then I came back to West Tennessee to go to college alone. So um, I kind of uh, understand mm. what that's like. Yes. Um, and uh, you obviously did well. Um, and um, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your degree, what you major in and what did you do right after college? So, um, I was an, I have a BA in English with a minor in photojournalism from Union. Uh, while I was there, I uh, was involved with a campus organization, um, with a literary magazine called The Torch. I was on staff all four years time there. I was editor my senior year and that was the organization I essentially, if I had something to say about my time at Union was well, the torch, you know, my work on the torch. I was very proud of that. I was proud of helping craft um, a, a physical print magazine um, that had short fiction, poetry, and art by students at Union. It was student-run, student-led, um, which is very neat. Um, and then after I graduated Union uh, in 2010, um, I actually returned a little bit later on the next year or so to work at union part-time. I was figuring out, I didn't want to go. I 
I had a desire to go to go on to graduate school, but I didn't want to go immediately. I wanted to get some work experience and also to polish um, my writing. So I spent a couple of years actually working at Union part time. I worked um, for the Office of University Communications um, for our director of marketing. And I also worked in the English department as an administrative assistant. Um, and um, in 2013, I um, moved to North Carolina um, to attend um, the MFA program at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and that is, that's a two-year program. And I'm a poet, so I, you know, had gone intentionally to study, to study poetry with um, David Roderick and um, a couple of other uh, folks that taught there. Michael Parker, who um, recently retired as a fiction writer, um, which I took classes with, with him as well. But a two-year intensive workshop program. Um, it was a small, uh, it's a small program, which is great um, for a workshop style. Um, I knew everyone in my um, cohort. There were about 15 of us, uh, poets and fiction writers. And when I was at UNCG, I also um, did a TA teaching assistantship. So I gained um, experience teaching college freshmen, um, which um, was terrifying, but I loved it. Um, and um, it was terrifying because I was, I was looking at these college freshmen and thinking like, well, you know, I, they look like babies. And also I feel like barely like older than them, but <laughs> they definitely thought I was, you know, much older as one realizes um, <laughs> later on. But um, so I spent two, well, I spent three years in North Carolina. So Greensboro um, is, a, is a really cool town with a hip yes. vibe, as they say, and they've done a great job. What's, uh, what kind of things did you pick up on uh, in Greensboro that you think you might have brought back to Jackson? Hmm. So Greensboro is a great, um, a great city. And um, the cool thing about that part of North Carolina um, is that that area, which is western um, central North Carolina, um, there is such an investment and pride in the arts in particular. Um, so for example, um, during my time in the program, I worked, um, or I volunteered for a nonprofit called right on as in to write right on Greensboro, which was run through the program, but it specifically, um, was designed to, um, teach writing, creative writing, host creative writing workshops for marginalized people, including I helped, um, I co-taught a class for um, homeless persons um, at the shelter in downtown Greensboro. I also co-taught a class at um, the neighbor, the, the library in my neighborhood um, for middle schoolers. But there is such an investment in the arts, whether that's um, musicians, um, whether that's visual arts, um, whether that's writing, um, their creative expressions, dance. Um, Greensboro was really the first place since um, London, since my childhood in London, where I was sort of exposed to um, oh, there's public art everywhere. Oh, the downtown um, is invested in and it's thriving. Um, also, um, there was an independent bookstore that opened when I was in the program at Greensboro, which I can definitely point to and have credited them with my decision decision to eventually open Light Trap. Um, what do you think that what was the payoff for Greensboro? They invested in the arts. Did you were you able to see the benefit? Y yes, I think so. The payoff, you know, it kind of it comes with its challenges as well because I think there's there's still this narrative that, well, yeah, the arts are cool and awesome, but people still don't get that. Well, yeah, in order for this to be here, in order for this to thrive, you have to support like money um, and investing. And um, I think there's a disconnect between 
seeing like, oh, this art is, is for everyone, it's free, and then actually seeing the people that created it, they have to be supported. Um, and so I think the challenge, I think the payoff was um, there was more, there were more people vocal about those kinds of issues and more um, recognition from community leaders, government, um, that, okay, we, we need to invest in these things or this is our priority. Um, and so I saw the payoff, but there's all that, that comes with a challenge. Um, so you yourself uh, decided at some point you got the bug to open an independent bookstore there in Jackson um, in the Midtown neighborhood. You had to have been debating the pros and the cons and does this make sense? The vast majority of people in the world would probably try to talk you out of it. And some of your friends maybe did. What, what were some of the things that, uh, what was the burr under your saddle that made you determined to open a bookstore? So when I moved back to Jackson in 2016, um, I, and I, I had known for years that Jackson has not had an independent bookstore. There was one uh, Davis kid years ago, which I remember visiting as a little girl. Um, but there hadn't been one since, you know, there's uh, a chain bookstore and we do have thrift bookstores, but from my experience in North Carolina recently, I had this vision that there ought to be an independent bookstore place where um, the community could gather. There would be events, there would be programming. Um, and also the selection of books would be curated specifically to West Tennesseans um, because this area is full it's, you know, the history, the culture, whether that's um, music, you know, from rockabilly to uh, blues, roots music in this area to even, you know, local, um, local legends like Casey Jones um, or um, with um, Sue, Sel Sue Shelton White with the um, anniversary of Tennessee's uh, ratification, um, giving women the right to vote. Um, you know, I, I wanted a place where readers and of all ages could come and find something for them and also find something that would reflect where they live. Um, but of course I, you know, when I thought of, Oh, Jackson needs an independent bookstore, all of the things I just said, I didn't think of that. I just thought, yeah, there should be an independent bookstore. And I would joke with friends cause I was teaching at the time I was teaching, um, at Union and later I taught at Jackson State. I was like, well, teaching, if I kind of, that doesn't work out, I'll open a bookstore, kind of as a joke. Um, and the biggest thing for me at the time was, well, yeah, the reason I can't and that I'm not going to open a bookstore is that I don't have the money, I don't have the capital, and I don't have the business. I didn't feel like I was a businesswoman, business person. Um, and it took me about three years to um, invest and learn and grow and kind of develop contacts and network in the area to realize, oh, this is actually a thing. Um, I ended up working here downtown um, at a store called Grubbs Grocery, which is an independent grocery store, only in, the only one in Jackson and in this part of West Tennessee. Um, and working at Grubbs, I realized, you know, I gained some, um, uh, some experience, um, grocery buying and ordering for the store, which definitely helped, um, with opening the bookstore, but that retail experience, you know, I'd worked retail customer service in as a college student, you know, um, but that experience, I think being downtown, it reminded me of, or well, it showed me that people in the area, not just in Jackson, will, they are willing to drive for miles around, upwards of an hour sometimes, and shop because they know the quality of goods. They also know um, that the service there it's, it's just going to be unparalleled to a chain. Um, and I started, you know, thinking about a bookstore again and thinking how an independent bookstore 
could offer similar thing. And the, the same thing with, um, you know, other local businesses, restaurants. And so people are very proud of, of the things that they can say, this is just in Jackson, or this is just in this, this town in West Tennessee. Um, because people, I think there's been a, a kind of full circle of, you know, with all that we can get online in particular and all the options, all the choices, all the convenience, which I shop online. I'm not anti-shopping online, but we've come full circle from the gamut, the literal um, availability of everything to where we are overwhelmed with decisions um, that we crave in-person shopping experiences or experiences. We crave those experiences again. Um, and whether that's a grocery store um, or um, my friends at the Garner Blue shop um, just down the road who sell jewelry, handmade, um, indigo dyed items, uh, decor. Is that Sarah Bellows? Uh, Garner Blue is uh, Lisa Garner. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. We've interviewed her here. Yes, before. yes, yes. Um, and actually, which we can talk about this a little bit, but the shop where that I'm currently in, Light Trap, is currently in, was Lisa's, uh, was the original Garner Blue shop. So. Very nice. Now, now you went a, a unique route um, when you when you decided to do a Kickstarter um, how confident were you that you were going to hit your goal? <laughs> well, so I knew that in order to be successful, I would need help from the community. And so when I was dreaming up Light Trap last year, last fall, I was sitting at my kitchen table late nights just trying to figure out how this would work. And then there were a couple of things that I knew would have to happen. One, I need to start small and I needed an affordable um, location. And I realized that could happen um, when I had a friend mention that um, the, the units in the local, which is Jackson's small business incubator, were coming up. And the units here, there are three units um, downtown just across from the farmer's market. But the three um, shops, they're each under 300 square feet. Um, and you sign a year lease, but you can be here for up to two years. Um, and so the turnover is designed to encourage businesses in startup phases um, to kind of give them and that the rent um, is such that it is affordable. Um, so I knew those were coming available. So I said, okay, so I'm going to shoot. I have to, I essentially said, I have to be in there. Otherwise life trap is not going to happen. And the other thing was I need to uh, do a Kickstarter, um, which some folks um, are familiar with Kickstarter, but a lot of, a lot of people are more familiar with GoFundMe, uh, which is, Similar concept, except GoFundMe is more associated with charity. Um, Kickstarter is specifically for um, business startups, for ideas and products. Um, and I had backed a couple before. Um, but, um, you know, when I sat down and said, okay, I need to raise $9,000, $10,000 for the store, um, that's the route I took. And there was anxiety. There was, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, my friends and family will back this, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, who else is going to do that? And I'm trying to remember the first, so um, it was a 30 day campaign. I Your launched, goal was 10,000. It was 9,000 originally, okay. bumped it up to 10,000 about halfway through. So I launched it on Valentine's Day um, this year. And the first, 24 hours of it being live, of the campaign being live, um, people had raised almost 40% of that goal. It's amazing. Hours. Yes. I, you know, had checked, I was refreshing the page, you know, my phone and checking it, but I stopped <laughs> checking it. And I had friends texting me like, have you looked at the totals? Um, 
it was incredible. And most of, and at the end, you know, it ran for 30 days. And at the end, we ended up raising over $11,000. So more than um, my original goal. Um, And it was mostly through people that live right here in West Tennessee in Jackson. And that was the thing that I still am most proud of um, in saying like, okay, so I was unsure if people here would want the thing that I was dreaming up, you know, um, in my Kickstarter, which Kickstarter, you have to have a well thought out kind of explanation of this is why I need this money. This is how I'm going to use it. And this is my story. But, and I still hear people um, because the Kickstarter page is still up. You can still visit it, but I still have customers that will come in who either they backed it or um, they found out about the store through the Kickstarter page. And that will tell me things like I really resonated with your story and I knew that we, you know, we've needed a place like this. And so that has been so encouraging to me. I mean, I think I would say that your ability to write well um, really contributes like to the Kickstarter to it. Mm -hmm. Of course it's written, it's written, it's almost like a poem itself. (laughs) Um, And so I think the ability to write well is not something that, um, everyone has. And so I think that's something that, that really uh, serves you well um, in business as a business person. Um, I'm not familiar enough with your timeline to know at what point in your business opening did we collectively hit the iceberg known as COVID. Um, so tell us, talk me through a little bit about, you know, you're getting, you've got this great dream. It's been validated. You're, you know, full steam ahead and then boom, uh, we all get uh, a curveball that we're still dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, COVID, uh, really, of course, you know, everyone, everyone has a different experience, whether, you know, from the illness, uh, from the disease itself to small business owners um, like myself. And COVID did throw me, throw me something, (laughs) Um, (laughs) as as I could say. Um, But to the original plan, which is so funny to think about this, you know, now it seems like forever ago that my plan was to open the store the end of March this year. Mm. Um, Because, you know, launched the Kickstarter in February. The goal was um, because some of that funding was to, I had um, to get the bookshelves custom built um, because of the space in here. So had build out, order inventory, open end of March. And I was, I was roughly, you know, I was, I was headed towards that. And then when the Kickstarter ended, that would have been around March 15th, um, across the country. I mean, already at that point, there were cities under lockdown, New York, LA, states of emergency. So, but around here, we hadn't had our first confirmed case, but we knew it was coming. It was a matter of time. And I started realizing, okay, so this is, I'm not going to open just yet, but I didn't fully, you know, until Jackson, you know, we had our safer at home, Mayor Conger issued our safer at home order um, around shortly after my birthday. I think it was right around my so which is March 25th. So around about there. Um, and that entered, that was about a period of, about six weeks where six to eight weeks where I honestly (laughs) was sitting at home, you know, occasionally doing my essential, you know, shopping and stuff because first of all, I realized like, well, a bookstore is not essential. I was not selling masks. Um, I, you know, there were, there were a lot of reasons why um, I could not open uh, for public health and safety, but I was sitting at home thinking, wow, I picked the worst time to become a small business owner. Um, And, you know, sitting there and also just a lot of my friends um, and 
uh, a lot of my friends and um, folks in my circle are small business owners as well, entrepreneurs, and it COVID has impacted them for sure. And whether that was is simply shutting down um, or trying to, you know, navigate the kind of the ins and outs of whether they were an essential business or not, um, money. Um, I thankfully, um, I will give credit to my, uh, to the folks, the local, which the local is run through Jackson Downtown Development Corporation, JDDC. Um, they um, did not, um, they said, we don't need rent from you, even though I had signed a lease um, and paid down, but they said, you don't need to pay rent, which helped me um, because I'd been, I'd left um, my previous job for, so I was unemployed um, and, um, you know, waiting on Kickstarter funds and all that. So there was, there was a period of anxiety for me. Um, and yet I was also so encouraged by the responses friends businesses ended up doing whether that was Garner Blue um, ended up they made masks you know they they pivoted and said all right we need to to help and this is how we're doing that um, to um, just the response from the community here um, people you know reaching out to me and saying hey hang in there light trap is still going to happen you're still um, we still need you hang in there. Um, so fast forward to June, um, and you know, Tennessee, we had started kind of our phase reopening. Um, and I decided that I could open the store with social distancing, um, in place. And so fast forward to, um, June 18th, 19th. Uh, 19th was when we had our grand opening, um, which was Friday and Saturday, 19th and 20th. Um, and, you know, masks were recommended at the point because we didn't have the mask mandate recommended. Um, I also, um, and still do have a customer limit in the store because as I mentioned earlier, these shops are, are small. They're under 300 square feet. So with, six feet social distancing. Um, I asked that there be a maximum of five customers in store at a time to browse comfortably. Um, I mean, it's the worst feeling in the world for someone to be breathing down your neck anyway, when you're browsing the store, but especially when you need to be social distancing. And do you serve um, uh, food? Do you have coffee or anything like that? No, I do not. Um, the space, well, this one is not, I wouldn't be able to do that anyway. Um, but yes, and that is small and, or excuse me, that is, you know, one of the things, you know, perhaps one of my neighbors could do that, which would be awesome. I would love that so much because coffee and books are just such a natural pairing. Um, but yeah, so the space is just for browsing. There is a little um, area to sit, um, have some chairs, benches. So I do encourage folks to sit down, hang out. Um, you know, when I opened, you know, I, I think just the excitement people had from, well, yes, it's a new thing. Um, people want to, you know, come out and check out the, the new thing in town. But it was a lot of, well, I think people were just so happy that, um, so happy that I was here and that there was something that they had been waiting for in some cases for years. Um, and a lot of people did indeed come in and say, this is, I wanted to do this and you're actually doing the thing that I wanted to do. <laughs> um, yeah, many, many people and my wife and I both to each other included have said, I wish we could open a bookstore. <laughs> so it's great that you're doing it. What? So eventually COVID is going to end and we will all eventually some, at some point, this is going to be. A, a nightmare slash memory. Um, what are your, uh, are you, are you at a point right now where you can plan what you're going to do next or are you just trying to perfect what you've got? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when I think about 
you know, even a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, I, there's a few things. So the nice, the good thing about being in the local is that knowing that I have two years here at the max, it gives me a chance to build my customer base, to explore events and programming on a smaller level. Um, you know, for example, this weekend, I have a book signing with a local author, James Cherry. Um, and later on, a couple weeks, um, Jackson has, uh, through our Jackson Home, which is an organization, um, there is 731 Day, hashtag 731 Day. And I will be, um, well, Light Trap will be hosting some events connected to that. And so already, you know, programming, um, whether that's signings, pop-up shops, um, book clubs have reached out to me about meeting here, um, which I'm doing, um, birthday parties, uh, appointment only shopping. I'm interested. I'm always seeking creative, innovative ways to serve my customers. Um, I'm working on a web shop right now um, to sell so folks can browse online, pick up in store. Um, eventually, I'm going to also sell uh, through bookshop.org, which is um, essentially the independent bookstores alternative to Amazon. So you can actually search for a book from an independent bookseller. Um, you can select Light Trap and um, you can help support me that way. Um, but the goal is to eventually move out from here and to remain downtown um, because I am, I'm extremely passionate about um, downtowns, um, probably from my experience in North Carolina and my experience um, probably in childhood of just seeing how neighborhoods and cities really, if the investment, if the, um, the dollars, if uh, the dollars and cents and people are there, then good things can happen and good things can be sustained. Um, so yes, that probably will look like I will get bigger. Um, that's my hope, but I am not looking, for example, People talk about Davis Kidd or people reference Books A Million, which is the chain um, in North Jackson. And, you know, I think um, independent bookstores have had to reinvent, reinvent themselves the past 10, 15 years in that, you know, the days of having a sprawling 2,000, 3,000 square foot store complete with cafe, children, you know, all this stuff, all, all the things, it's not sustainable. Um, and uh, I've noticed there's a trend that's hopefully coming more of a established thing of looking at retail as a multi, uh, a multi space where yes, you kind of, you can use it for retail, but you can also shift pivot to events, to workshop, to having a space for the community. Um, and yes, um, you know, maybe that'll look like having coffee or having a little um, wine bar or having a children's play area or something. You know, I, yes, I have ideas and dreams in my head, but also recognizing that um, to start small and to start like doing things well, um, you have to do them well before you kind of uh, I guess, I guess doing things well does not equate to doing things big. Um, any advice or, or, uh, any good energy you can share for those other small business owners out there listening mm -hmm. who are going through the same thing we're all going through right now, just trying to make their way any, uh, to close us out, anything you can share that you think might be helpful? Yeah, my, my encouragement to fellow small business owners and entrepreneurs is to know that you're not alone. 
I think that's the biggest thing that I had to face um, is this sense of, oh, this is my thing, this is my idea, this is my business, therefore I am responsible for all the ins and outs, its failures and successes. Yes, to some extent, but also recognize it takes a village. Um, I had the privilege of um, going through a program called Co-Starters um, here in Jackson, which is based out of the Co, which is a co-working space, uh, meaning that it's a shared um, space for small business owners, entrepreneurs um, to um, come and whether that's have their office or to use a conference room or to use um, a, the three printer, uh, for example. But they have a program called Co-Starters, uh, which I went through and actually we finally wrapped up. It's, it, it's supposed to be a nine week program that culminates in a pitch night where um, so you um, spend nine weeks learning about everything from marketing to um, legal issues, insurance to pricing costs, um, practical, and as well as, um, I guess, the ins and outs of the mindset of being a business owner, small business owner. But it culminates in a pitch night. Um, and because of the pandemic, we had to pause for, we were almost um, to pitch night. We were two weeks from pitch night when the pandemic really well came, you know, to this area and shut down. So last night, actually, we finally got to have a socially distanced pitch night for our class. Um, and this year they changed it up and they had, um, so there's a panel of judges and they changed it up where they actually were offering a cash prize um, and a package that included a marketing um, opportunity and uh, support. And I actually came, so Light Trap came in second, which I'm very proud of. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, I tied for second. Um, and um, the young woman that won, um, I am so excited for her and for her opportunity. She um, isn't from Jackson. She's from West Tennessee, but has a great idea for a product that she wants to bring uh, to specifically um, the hair and beauty um, industry um, that I think is truly innovative. Um, but so I say, I explain co starters on that to say that my advice is seeking out other business owners, small business owners, and finding a mentor. And programs like Co-Starters are a great way to do that. Um, and again, Co-Starters is for West Nessians. You don't have to be in Jackson. We have folks from all over the area participate. Um, and it's a great support. But knowing that you're not alone and also um, – you know, recognizing that, I mean, even, even if, you know, it, it's strange to say this, even if the pandemic wasn't here, had not happened, it still would have been a challenge opening the store. Um, that's just what comes with the territory and the challenge of, um, you know, translating your idea, your idea to reality. Um, you know, we have, we have, um, our kind of vision, but then when it comes, if you're dealing with customers, which most, you know, small business, that is, you know, they are customer, um, consumer based, um, you know, you have to be willing to be in innovative and creative. And that's my other kind of piece of advice is, um, to be willing to listen and to, um, kind of take a step back and say, oh, okay, this isn't working. Let's try something else. Yeah, I think the key word you said a while ago was pivot. We definitely mm -hmm. here at Discovery Park have learned all about pivoting in the last few months. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, congratulations on your book. I can't wait to your bookstore. I can't wait to visit the next time I'm in Jackson, which we go there all the time. Um, so I'm going to stop by and um, I'm going to buy some books. Yes. 
And thank you so much for being um, on our podcast today. Well, thank you so much for um, inviting me. And I am so excited um, for what y'all are doing through the podcast. Um, It's really neat that you are wanting to highlight um, stories of West Tennesseans in the area, which is something I, I love and want to do as well. So thank you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.